suffocating that you wonder whether you surface from being able to breathe. And I think that's a really, really important point because when we're talking about Black Lives Matter, we're talking about the people which are trying to do stuff within the academy and outside of the academy, which are black. And I think that's an important point. And what we struggle with is as things take momentum, that we push, get pushed back into the background, and then we put our hands up and say, hey, hang on a moment, black lives matter. So it's part of that, we we'll hold on to that, we're gonna have a really good debate about gender. Um, and the last thing I'll say as well, which I think has come up a couple of times here, is around the fact of the suffering, suffering in silence of black women, black girls, and what that means in relation to their well-being, and on top of that, in the relation of being visible and being seen visible. So without ado, I'm going to introduce my first panelist, which is um, Althea Legal, uh, Legal Miller. And um, each of them have got around about 14 minutes. I'll stop them at that time. And then um, it enables us to have a little bit more time for discussion as well. OK, over to Althea. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So for the next 15 minutes, um, I'm going to be concerned with the history and the continuing legacies of sexual police brutality against African Americans. And for the purposes today, I'm going to be talking about African American women and how that's often overlooked in these larger and broader issues of police ac um, accountability and violence. So some may ask, oh, why? Why specifically sexual police brutalities? Surely all brutalities matter. Um, and I would answer in part that a recent report revealed that sexual misconduct by police officers is the second most prevalent crime amongst police officers. The second most prevalent crime. And furthermore, I would add that sexual violence by police officers during arrest and booking procedures disproportionately affects um, women, black cis and trans women. I want to start with a narrative. The date is 1962. We're in Clarksdale and we're in Mississippi, United States. Two male white police officers come to the door of a black teenager. Her name's Betsy Turner. She's 19. They come to her door and they charge her with the theft of a colleague where she works in local government. She denies the theft, but nevertheless, she's taken down to the police station for an interrogation, which quickly turns violent and sadistic. The teenager is made to lie face down on the concrete floor. She's ordered to pull her dress up and her panties down. The police officers remove the belts that they are wearing and begin to lash her on her back as well as her buttocks. Turn over and open your legs and let me see what you look down there, demands one of the officers. Then he proceeds with that belt he was wearing to lash her on her genitals. Another officer says, if you tell anybody what's happening here, we're going to bring you back and really whip you. Throughout the sexual assault, Betsy Turner is crying. She's pleading her innocence. And the signs of the beating are all too visible. In the end, the police officers tell her, look, wipe your eyes uh, and fix yourself up. And after it's over, it's not really over because they tell her to remove her bra so that they could check to see maybe that she hid the money and had the money on her all along. Fast forward, it's June 21st, it's 2015. It's about 10.30 at night, and now we're in Texas, Harris County. A white male deputy from the sheriff's office is going to pull over Sharnesia Calling. She's a 21-year-old African-American woman who's driving in her car, and apparently she didn't stop at a, um, a stop sign. The officer engages her, says that he can smell marijuana, so she's told to come out of the car. He handcuffs her, and he places her in the back of his patrol car. He then proceeds to search her car looking for marijuana for an hour. He doesn't find anything. 
He returns and he comes back to his patrol car where Corley is sat in the back and says, I can smell marijuana in my car now. And as it's not on you, it's not in your pockets, it must be inside your body. He's then gonna call for female officers to come to the roadside. Remember, this is a traffic stop. They come to the roadside so that they can conduct a body cavity search on the street outside. So two female officers are going to turn up. One's black, one's white. They arrive separately. Corley, quite rightfully, physically resists the policewoman attempting to spread her legs apart. I would call that self-defense. So they throw her onto the ground, handcuffed. They strip her completely naked from the bottom. They place her in what is sometimes referred to as a hog tie position. Briefly, that is that your um, legs are tied or handcuffed to one leg or two legs to your wrist, one wrist or two wrists. Um, she's in that position for 11 minutes. It's an extremely painful position. At one point, the male white officer says, we're gonna break your legs if you don't open them. He then holds a torch over her naked body to illuminate the search as the police women push their fingers into her vagina looking for marijuana. They don't find anything. And Corley cries and again pleads for them to stop. It's likely that we know about these two cases because of the black activist climate that these police assaults took place. Betsy Turner during the civil rights movement and Sharnisia Corley during the Black Lives Matters, and significantly, I would say, the Say Her Name campaign, which is an explicit outgrow of the marginalization of black women in that popular rally and call, Black Lives Do Matter. And as we know that less than a month later, we would learn of the horrific, suspicious deaths in custody of African-American women and girls three in particular, all in July 2015, Sandra Bland found hung with a plastic bag, Kendra Chapman hung with a bed sheet, Kimberly Randall King hung with a t-shirt, all in July 2015. In my brief remaining time, I want to invite you to see how the civil rights movement of the 1960s against sexual police brutality might actually have some relevant insights for Black Lives Matters organizing today. And so 50 years ago, led by African-American female activist Dorothy Height, then the president of the National Congress of Negro Women, NCNW, made this vital intervention during the civil rights movement. It was mobile across race and across faith backgrounds to prioritize the prevention of police sexual violence against female activists. And she said, we need to do this. We need to prior prioritize this alongside the right to vote and the right to integrate public accommodations. And as many of you will appreciate in male-led movements, sexual violence against women is not ranked with police violence and not police sexual violence or jail-based violence. So this is a really radical departure. Protecting female activists who are struggling for freedom is as important as the right to vote. And that's something we really need to remember today. And so black women were at the forefront of this movement within the movement. And we know that the civil rights movement is a series of local movements, much like Black Lives Matters is. What do they do? They identify that state-enforced sexual violence was a tool to suppress radical black organizing. And number two, they generated much needed um, attention on the various forms of white oppression. And this would be on um, the stories that we commonly hear uh, around um, say lynchings or other forms of violence. And here we see black women actually talking about in the 60s, sexual intimidation, voyeurism, stalking, strippings, and sexualized beatings, abuse of search authority, involuntarily, involuntary medical procedures. So we see female activists are being experimented on that's sanctioned by the government. 
molestations and rape as well. <coughs> and they're dedicated to the problem of protecting or the issue of protecting women and girls. Um, and this actually signals a really fresh candor. Remember, this is the 60s. This is not the time you talk about rape or you talk about sexual violence. And also the, the ways in which sex and <coughs> violence um, are not really distinguishable in the ways in which through a feminist movement and women's organizing, we really begin to identify how rape is a crime of violence and not sex. So in 1963, Dorothy Height goes on the radio in New York, and she talks about how jailers and police officers are engaging in the rape and sexual abuse of civil rights activists, including young girls as well, teenage girls as well. Unsurprisingly, there's a backlash, because there's always a backlash. White audiences don't like this. There's an outcry, there is um, verbal abuse, nasty letters. Some just say, look, this is bad taste. You can't talk about you know, rape on the radio. It's not decent. Dorothy Hyatt is also questioned on the radio about, well, do you know for a fact this happens? And so, again, having to prove your own violations. And Dorothy Hyatt says, yes, I do know this for a fact. We've heard from black women. We've also heard from white women who are being arrested, who are being molested in jails, who are also being treated to medical examinations. Again, looking for drugs, old tactic. It's used in the 60s against female activists. And we see young girls um, during the movement are actually, they have vaginal ex um, um, examinations um, on the pretext that they're looking for, um, for drugs. There's a conference that's organized and that's in 1964. Hyde actually um, forms an interracial and interfaith um, conference with around 75 women. And during that session, Hyde again is saying, look, this is urgent work that we need to be doing. We really need to be focused on sexual police brutality against the community. And so to end, I just want to pull out two points that we can discuss later that comes out of this conference. Thank you. Black women took the opportunity to instruct the white delegates who were in that room to talk about the heightened vulnerabilities for African-American women, those women of African descent. They also talked about how narratives of black femininity, <coughs> black femininity is hypersexual, is somehow deviant. They expressed and talked about those narratives and how they're actually used to legitimize violence against their bodies and to legitimize state violence. Of course, that conversation was about intersectionality. Um, number two, Black women cast aside these norms of respectability to unmask this everyday rituals of white supremacist oppression. Black women began to realize in the 60s that respectable silence is about sexuality. You know, there's things you don't talk about in public did not foreclose these bold denunciations against sexual violence, okay? So being, you know, the norms of sexuality and not talking about that publicly does not mean you can't talk about sexual assaults. Those are different things. And so black women begin to express that. And what they do is they really, they understand that they're risking, they're taking a risk here. They're risking their voices being manipulated. That's what the history has done. They risk the manipulation of their voices to actually speak. And they also very importantly don't frame these police officers' actions as, you know, depraved acts or just one-off acts or, got yeah, one-off acts or indeed, um, uh, sorry, I lost my thread. Yes, they're not sudden fits of rage, okay? These are ideologically coherent. Okay, this is about social control. This isn't someone who is just lust driven. And so the lessons for us today really are that we do need to engage with some of the detrimental effects of respectability, politics, of course, 
We've had um, Audre Lorde already quoted here, the uh, queer black poet, where she says, your silence won't protect you. And really we get a sense of that if we look to the usable past, that we do need to speak, that these are not random, but they are ideologically coherent. And so I say that mobilization today has to also take account of sexual misconduct. We can also use past gender struggles for racial justice because they indeed provide a very powerful example for us today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Althea. So as we move on um, briefly, uh, swiftly to Ella um, Achala. Yes, okay. Ella, are you gonna stay there or are you gonna yeah. come up here? You're gonna stay here, okay. And um, she starts off with Ain't I a Woman and tell her story. So she will be um, presenting us next. Okay. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to say that I'm really honored to be here today. Thank you in particular also to Professor Zoe Trod who um, wrote to me about this event and was really encouraging throughout the whole process of putting it together. Um, because these kinds of platforms are really important because they allow us to have conversations that don't too often happen in public. So um, my name is Ella Chola. I'm currently doing my master's in migration and diaspora studies at SOAS, University of London. And um, I co-started the Ain't I a Woman Collective during my undergrad. And we are now a group of six black and mixed race women of different backgrounds based in London, and we're trying to carve out space for black women's voices through our online blog, to which we receive submissions from around the world, um, including the US, as well as putting on different events, such as different Black Girl Sundays and panel discussions, some of which are restricted to women of color, black women, others which we open up to, to, any, to anybody. So um, I've changed the focus of my talk to be a little less about social media and more about this idea of turning dispossession into resistance, which has been happening all around the world and is also exactly what happened when Patrice Cullors, Opal Tometi and Alicia Garza started the Black Lives Matter movement and initiated a mass movement really that has traveled the world. And I take this phrase of turning dispossession into resistance from my lecturer, Dr. Aliosha Tudor, since this phrase and the endless possibilities really that it holds have uh, stuck with me ever since she first mentioned it. Um, so in this talk, um, I use black feminism as an implicit lens for this presentation in which speaking as a mixed race woman, part of a black feminist collective, of course informs the, the way I view the world and shape my personal activism, just like the subjectivities of the women who started Black Lives Matter impact on how they structure their activisms. And so I'd like to begin with a poem submitted by one of the regular writers to our collective, Nadine Robinson, a black woman in the UK who shared how she felt about what was happening in the States when the newspapers here were aflame with reports about the protests. Um, it's quite graphic, so that's just a warning beforehand, but it kind of comes with the topic of the conference. And um, it's called The Blood Runs Deep. The blood runs deep in heated streets. The flare of rage and toxic thick air overwhelm the ebony skin. White bullets piercing black flesh. It falls, splashes against the concrete roads. The blood runs deep. Rich in color, royal red. The blood of future kings and queens spilt like bad milk down the drain of racist ignorance. High-pitched screams. Warriors consumed by heartfelt anger. Mothers in mourning daily. The blood runs deep. So deep that the ocean's waves are unable to wash away the stench of death that invades its shores. I can't breathe, they say, as they drown in their ruby liquid. Let me go, they protest in the clear of day. Yet they abound in the same shackles that their ancestors once wore. Clasps of metal bracelets forced onto innocent hands. The blood runs deep. The conscious efforts of the next generation now removed in one swift swoop of a fully loaded gun. Civil rights, that phrase lost in translation to a blinded nation run by ignorant fools. Bruised egos and lack of compassion linger in the blackened sky. Rain attempting to rinse the pain away. The blood runs deep, into our veins pumping our hearts. We are alive, wanting to live, 
life cut so short for the white man's ignorant bliss. The fatherless children, the widowed wives, the loss of a child who has not even had a full life experience as his wings were clipped. So no more. The blood runs deep, we bleed. We bleed daily. The struggle of survival weighs so heavy on our backs, bringing us down, holding us in position to shoot us in our side and pierce our flesh with I don't care if you can't breathe. The blood runs deep. Silence falls among the crowded streets, eyes filled with despair, destruction, and dehumanization. We shall overcome, faintly heard from our heritage. One day, the hopes for a better future, a day that makes sure that black lives matter. The sound of colored children's feet making the innocent pitter patter along the savage streets. I will continue to dream. I will continue to rise above the ignorance, above the false identity. The blood runs deep, our love everlasting. We will have justice, royalty, freedom. So in this poem, Nadine specifically reacts to the killing of Freddie Gray. So in this instance, she wasn't talking about the many women who have, of course, also lost their lives due to police brutality. Rakia Boyd, Sandra Bland, Kendra Chapman, Tanisha Anderson, Maya Hall, Ayanna Jones, and so many more who have been highlighted, for example, by the Say Her Name movement. The reason I wanted to share this poem is because words are powerful, even more so when they travel. Just as Black Lives Matter was born out of the labor and love of queer black women who turned their feelings of dispossession into resistance, Nadine too turned her dispossession her feelings of anger, frustration, and sadness into a poem. By putting these feelings into words, she is actively resisting the silencing and erasure of black people's voices and black women's voices and stories in particular, as she writes. And this is something that black people, black women, have been doing all over the world. So I was asked to draw parallels between the Black Lives Matter movement and the work we do with the collective. And I must say that I felt quite daunted by that task because I didn't want to make it just about us. And I didn't want to take a conversation about Black Lives Matter and turn it into something else, not recognizing the work of the women who had created this movement and whose labor has repeatedly gone unacknowledged and their ideas turned on their heads. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized the connections and the more I could see traces of Gilroy's Black Atlantic as a diasporic space that is of course transnational interconnected and must be intersectional, as black people are dispersed throughout the world by various routes, but often find ourselves fighting similar struggles towards emancipation, autonomy, and citizenship, to quote Gilroy directly. Very important to Black Lives Matter is the fact that it is an intersectional movement, which also means that it goes beyond police brutality and also focuses on poverty and, for example, undocumented immigration. And is obviously inclusive of all black people across genders, sexualities, abilities, ages, etc. As reinforced in a recent interview with the Cosmopolitan, Colors and Tomati were very clear that from the very beginning, their stories and those of black women more generally would not be erased. They emphasized that we live intersectional lives, which must be reflected in the movements that we join, as they echo one of my favorite black feminists, Audrey Lord, who has been mentioned repeatedly. Yeah. And this resonates with the work we do as, with the collective, where we accept submissions of self-identifying black women. We welcome a variety of voices across sexuality, ability, etc., to illustrate that black people are not all the same, that black women are not all the same, resisting meta-narratives about what it means to be black and woman, and going beyond racist tropes to put our commitment to intersectionality at the heart of what we do. At the collective, we're a group of young black feminists who have decided to take charge and write down our own histories. We, we may not change the world with immediate effect, but we have created a platform where we can deal with trauma collectively, where we can turn our collective dispossession into resistance by recounting our individu individual experiences. We're a collection of histories by black women from all over the world, as we hope to connect black women from the diaspora and show ourselves that we are not alone, especially in Europe, where we can often find ourselves in majority white spaces. We rejoice with each other's triumphs, but we also emphasize, empathize with each other's pain as we recognize supranational patterns of oppression. As put by the writer Wendell P. Simpson, I quote, European solidarity with Black Lives Matter goes beyond sympathy for black Americans. It is part of a movement to end racist policing in Europe, end quote. 
When I say the names of Uri Jallo, Dominique Cumadio, and the two women, Ndea Mariani Saar and Christy Schwundek, I'm saying the names of those killed by police brutality in my home country, Germany, because their black lives matter too. When I say the names of Mark Duggan, Jimmy Mubenga, and Sheikh Bayou, I affirm that black lives matter in the UK and all over the world as well. Our struggles are transnational, interconnected, and intersectional, which is why it is important to build connections between black people and our allies all over the world to fight anti-black racism, to spark dialogue amongst black people, and to facilitate the types of connections necessary to encourage social action as env envisaged by Colors Tomiti and Garza when they started Black Lives Matter and wanted to lift up black lives as an opportunity to connect struggles across identities, including race, class, gender, nationality, sexuality, and ability. Our movements are so much more than Twitter conversations, blog posts, and the odd hashtag. Whilst online activism is often dismissed as a cry for attention, not as effective or having real impact, we have seen with Black Lives Matter how a movement that was born out of initial conversations on Facebook and Twitter and these kinds of platforms that have, result, have resulted in thousands of people going on the streets to demand justice. We see how almost 15,000 people have clicked on our collective's website since we launched in March because they connect with what we do as we receive submissions from all kinds of women around the world. Individual stories that highlight our collective dispossession that is transformed into resistance, echoing what happened with Black Lives Matter. Audrey Lord reminded us that our silence will not protect us. Even though so many stories may not have been told in the past, we're telling them ourselves all over the world as part of a tradition of resilience and commitment to justice that has traveled across oceans and weaves together the histories of black women and histories of black people more generally from around the world. And we will continue to turn our dispossession into resistance because to end on the paraphrased words of Nadine's poem, there's hope for a better future a day that makes sure that all black lives matter. We will continue to dream, we will continue to rise above the ignorance, and we will have justice, royalty, freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ella. Thank you, Ella, very powerful message there. Um, and we're moving on to our um, final speaker before we um, start our discussion, which is uh, Stephanie Davis who's um, going to be looking at queer and trans people of color activism and the Black Lives Matter movement, resisting the silences and intersections of race, gender, and sexuality. Welcome. So uh, today I'm looking at, at queer and trans people of color activism and the Black Lives Matter movement and how they both resist the silences on the intersections of uh, race, gender, and sexuality. So for queer and trans people of color, um, they find themselves often marginalized and sidelined in lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans, or LGBT communities, as well as black and people of color communities. Theoretically and academically, um, race, gender, and sexuality are often analyzed as single strands, leaving those of us with intersecting identities living in the borderlands. My PhD research is interested in those recent, so the recent surge of queer and trans people of colour activist networks across the UK. And in this paper, um, I'll present a few of the initial findings um, from my research, considering how QTPOC and the Black Lives Matter movements together um, resist the silences of uh, race, gender and sexuality. I would like to reflect on the importance of my work to the black struggle and also the potential intersectional moment of our movements. Just before I start, I'd like to look at definitions as well, just in case people haven't heard of queer and trans people of colour as a term or an acronym for QTPOC. So queer is used as an umbrella term for non-heterosexuals, so it's a reclamation of a what once was a derogatory word or an insult. So now people reclaim that, that word, and that can include people who are bisexual, lesbian, gay, queer, unident un undefined, questioning and exploring. Queer can also include trans, and trans is an umbrella term for intersex, trans or transgender, gender queer, gender variant or non-conforming people. People of colour is also an umbrella term incorporating a wide range of, of people from different racial identities and is used as a form of political solidarity. A couple of other words I'd like to quickly define, I'm going to use within the presentation, is heteronormativity. So that is the belief that people fall into distinct and complementary genders, so just that there is just men and women, um, and that they have natural roles in life. And also it asserts that heterosexuality is the only sexual orientation or the norm. 
We also have white normativity, which I'm sure you understand. So these are cultural norms and practices that make whiteness appear natural, normal, and right. And just to go over trans or transgender again, so that means someone who identifies as a gender other than the one they were assigned at birth. And cis or cisgender is identifying as the gender you were assigned at birth. Okay? So moving on to understanding Kutapok activism. As I said, over the last number of years, there's been a surge of Kutapok activist groups and collectives emerging across the UK and a number of countries in Europe. These groups are exclusively run by and for Kutapok, independent from mainstream, read white, LGBT communities. As a Kutapok organiser myself, trained in critical community psychology, I'm interested in what Kutapok activisms mean to those involved um, with, and within the UK context. In phase one of my research, I uh, contacted three Kutapok groups across the UK and invited their members to focus groups to discuss their involvement in this form of activism. So for now, I'd like to focus on just a few of those findings. So the facilitation of groups, um, group spaces exclusively by and for Kutapok was defined as participants as a form of political activism. And the three of the findings I want to focus on today were that Kutapok groups aim to, one, create space to disidentify with white normativity and heteronormativity, two, facilitate a decolonising process, and three, centre the physical and mental well-being of Kutapok. Moving on to uh, first, dis disidentification. So all groups emphasise the need for and the purposeful creation of spaces away from whiteness and straightness, giving room for disidentification with white normativity and heteronormativity. Jose Munoz's term disidentification is used here to describe the development of, quote, survival strategies the minority subject practices in order to negotiate a phobic majoritarian public sphere that continuously elides or punishes the existence existences of subjects who do not conform, end quote. The participants describe the joy of cutie box spaces in which for some short time they could experience being in a majority space, in which they could be both queer and or trans and a person of colour without contradiction. The groups are exclusive to queer and trans people of colour and when asked about white and straight people being involved, it was made clear by participants that this would inhibit Kutapok from talking freely about their lived experiences and undertaking this disidentificatory disident work. There was a need for a safe space away from white and straight gazers. This is a quote from one of the members of the group. I'll leave you to read. So in this quote, Annabelle describes a creative project undertaken by the group to consider the possibilities for sexual difference and gender variance in different historical and cultural contexts. This ignites the, the potential for queering perhaps more patriarchal and heteronormative understandings of our histories from our places of origin as people of colour. This challenges the notion of queerness as a Western or white invention envisioning spaces within our histories and cultures in which we see ourselves reflected back, that we do exist, and not just in the image of Western and white queerness and transness. Moving on to uh, the decolonising process, research participants describe Kutapok groups as spaces um, for facilitating decolonisation and a querying of what is called a colonial, uh, quote, colonial gender and sexual categories. To briefly unpack what is meant by colonial gender and sexual categories, scholars of history, uh, critical race theory and queer theory consider colonisation as a heteronormative force which punished and aimed to stamp out the gender and sexual variants of the racialized other. Examples include the two-spirit people of the indigenous Americans, the hijras of India and the same-sex relations favoured by King Wang of Buganda. Imperialist, imperialist notions of a gender binary of there only being men or women as opposed to a huge range in gender variant practices and, ident uh, and identities were imposed along with the belief that heterosexuality was the norm and homosexuality and bisexuality were deviant practices. 
However, moving forward to the current moment, the modernist development of identity categories based upon sexual and gender differences in the West has allowed, to some extent, uh, the rehabilitation of queer and gender variant identities into mainstream acceptance. Critics note the recent development of a globalising Western LGBT politic and what is described as a homo nationalist project by Poirot 2007. This explores recent moves that work to present the West as a haven for LGBT people, as a champion for the individual and fairness, embracing certain members of the LGBT population in, as neoliberal citizens. Meanwhile, racialized, minoritized communities, particularly Muslim communities, are positioned as traditional, backwards, static, and inherently queerphobic and transphobic. Poor 2007, among others, question how the narrative of LGBT rights has been co-opted into nationalist and imperialist discourses and been utilised for imperialist expansionism and the continued surveillance of particular communities. So as we um, see here in the news, um, um, homophobia in certain communities is seen as a sign of extremis extremism and also a kind of, of quite a strong discourse in our culture of black communities as being inherently homophobic, more homophobic than white people. So black participants and Muslim of colour participants spoke of being stereotyped as potentially queerphobic and transphobic threats in queer places and spaces, while others described the impulse of white LGBT communities wanting to save them from their communities of colour and encouraging cutipop to leave their communities of origin behind. Participants were very conscious of these complex histories of racialisation, as well as the contemporary globalisation of Western LGBT politics and were committed to challenging the contradictory ways they were positioned within them. Participants in uh, one group discussed the importance of cutipox groups as spaces of decolonization, as spaces which problematize the dominance of white Western LGBT projects. Hunt and Home suggests that decolonizing queer politics is one which is, quote, not only anti-normative, but actively engages with anti-colonial, critical race and indigenous theories and geopolitical issues, such as imperialism, colonialism, globalization, migration, neoliberalism, and nationalism, end quote. This is a politic in which cutipot queer colonial gender and sexual categories. There is a burgeoning movement to decolonize sexualities and genders of which cutipot are a part. This decolonizing movement emphasizes that the gender binary, male or female, um, transphobia, heteronormativity, and queerphobia were colonial interventions. To decolonize, Kitapot referred to unpacking the complexities of queerness, transness, and of colorness within wider projects of decolonization. So another quote for you. For this member, being within a Kitapot space meant that they were able to explore their own gender outside of a gender binary and found that their own decolonizing process was also intertwined with what they called a kind of cis deprogramming. So Kutipok um, then worked to resist what Hess and Saeed, 2002, describe as the discourse of Western needs or the language of Western supremacy, which emphasizes Western liberal democracy, progressiveness, and particularly the idea of equality as a bastion of British values. Kutipok challenged the narratives of progressiveness, highlighting racism and potential nationalism in mainstream LGBT narratives and the continuing oppression experienced by black communities and communities of color. They also question Western LGBT paradigms, considering the complexities of where they're situated at the intersections of race, sexuality, and gender, racism, imperialism, queerphobia, and transphobia. Racing through really quickly. Um, so the third um, finding I want to focus on was the centering of physical and mental well-being of Kutipok. And to remember uh, what Karen was saying about the houndings. So navigating multiple minoritized intersecting identities as a queer and or trans person of color, as well as negotiating multiple intersecting oppressions, was described as having an effect on physical health, mental health, and well-being. In particular, the trauma of racism was experienced as having far-reaching effects and disabling effects. Um, therefore, Kutipot groups were seen as key spaces for support, survival, and resistance. <laughs> Part 
Participants noted high rates of physical and mental ill health within Kitapot communities, and in particular that trans people of colour, especially trans women of colour, uh, dis uh, disproportionately experience acts of extreme violence and murder. Um, participants link this to the intersections of multiple oppressions and in experiencing multiple marginalisations. Um, it's beyond the scope of this paper to talk about uh, necropolitics, but I was really interested in um, necropolitics and queer necropolitics and this idea that certain populations are left to die a kind of slow death. So some um, populations are welcomed into life and others, such as black communities, are left for um, social death and premature um, physical death. And we see this particularly um, with people who are multiply marginalised and the, in, the, the huge rates of uh, violence against uh, black trans women, especially in the United States. Moving quickly on then to considering Kutipok and Black Lives Matter together. Um, black Lives Matter and Kutipok are simultaneous movements that overlap in their work and bring the promise of intersectional organising to black struggle. Five or so years ago, when I was involved in deaths in police custody um, protests in Birmingham and Manchester, um, black queer women like myself worked quietly on these campaigns, focused primarily on black cis heterosexual men. However, now I'm encouraged by the inroads that, that Black Lives Matter and Kitapok make in making a more intersectional movement. Uh, Kitapok and Black Lives Matter problem problematise the heteronormativity of black struggle, Moving away from the traditional, often patriarchal, black leadership, emphasising a multiplicity of voices and increasing what is, de what is deemed to be a black or a queer issue. Black, queer and trans folks now fight for recognition in our movements and can no longer be sidelined within them. Uh, Kitapok and Black Lives Matter emphasise a disidentificatory process away from the intersection of white normativity and heteronormativity, seeing the politics of respectability as a trick which limits the possibilities of liberation for all black people. Both movements also challenge the discourse of Westernese, which positions the West as a champion of equality and freedom, refusing to forget histories of slavery, colonialism, imperialism, and how they have shaped our contemporary moment and continuing struggle. They both resist what is seen as the banality or mundanity of black social or premature physical death for multiple marginalized people. Just last bit. Um, I just wanted to add that Zella Ziona um, in the last couple of weeks was the, the 22nd trans person of colour who was murdered in 2015. And the majority of um, trans people of colour who were murdered um, this year have been black trans women. Um, and finally, both mo movements remind us that black queer lives matter and black trans lives matter. Thank you. Okay, so if I can ask my panellists to come back on the stage. Um, I presume the lights will rise up again. Thank you. Um, just really summarising what's actually been said. I think it was really, really interesting. We've got our three um, colleagues here, which started off with Althea. Althea's um, talk, of course, presentation was around um, women and the sexualization of um, uh, brutalization of police and the hounding of, of women and what that actually means. We then moved into um, Ella's and um, uh, Ella's particular work, which again was on um, the notion of intersectional and what that means in relation to a changing world, but also the fact that she set up this um, Ain't I a Woman, what that meant. And, I, and one little thing I'd like to say about Ella's, I remember bumping into her, when she bumped into me at 10 o'clock at night one night when I'd just come out of the university. And she said, um, Asked, is that, your, is that Victoria? I said, yes, that's, that's me. And she said, oh, I came to one of your um, talks the other day and it inspired me to s help set up this particular Ain't I a Woman. So I thought, you know, that's, that's really nice. Um, also, Stephanie, Stephanie's particular work, very passionate around the work around um, queer and um, trans people of colour and activism. That uh, threw up another load of discussion regarding the notion of whiteness, the notion of identity and the inclusiveness of voice. What runs across all three of these is the word interse intersectionality, the word around whiteness, the word around identity, and this notion of um, what it means to have an inclusive voice. So I think that opens up a little bit of room for some discussion. Now, um, one of the things we need to do now is to really get some of your voices to be able to pose a question. I am quite brutal. If I see that you're going on for too long, I'll just cut you and say, please get to the point and get a question. So we've got a bit of time, we've made up some time, so we've got a good bit of time now before lunch to have a discussion. So, 
I'll start with you. And I also want to make sure we've got some people across the audience which haven't spoken as well. Yes. Could you, could you please line Maybe up um, yeah. here in the middle? Thank you. Do you want to, do you want to hold the mic? Yeah, Can I'm happy enough to sure do that. Brief? Yeah, 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 no worries. <laughs> Um, yeah, interesting article in the Guardian Women just a little while ago on misogyny. Noir. You'll be familiar with this, I know. Um, I'm with the group, with thesis group here, um, Adrian. Um, I'm just interested in that debate. It also impacts on on on, on questions of, of mixed race and, and culture, and it also impacts on what you call Westernese, which I I understand, but in terms of progressiveness. Um, can that progressiveness and Westernese work against us? In which, in, in what way? So, do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, in terms of yeah, normalisation. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can we also make sure that the um, that the microphones go to the people? We haven't got a thousand people in here. I think you can do some walking. All right. Thank you very much. What so, was my thoughts earlier? <laughs> <laughs> Mine was more for Stephanie, I guess. And, and sorry, um, who are you? Sorry, my name's Stacey. Right, thanks, Tracy. Um, so, yeah, about I, I follow Laverne Cox on um, my Instagram and Facebook and stuff, and um, that's the only way I've seen that trans, particularly trans women in America, are being attacked. Um, so, do you think there is a problem that, I guess, the Black Lives Matter movement isn't really kind of letting people know that this is happening? And is it a problem in the UK as well? Okay, all right. Thank you, Tracy. Um, there's a question at the back, I can't see. Yep, there's a question down here. Oh, Adam, is that Adam? Yes, yes. hi Adam. <laughs> hi, um, I've got two very brief, Victoria, uh, questions. Um, the first one is about um, the idea of not, not only are the police um, as a kind of a patriarchal kind of force, but the state is itself as a patriarchal violence power structure and how we can link the idea of the state being inherently white supremacist with the, the state being inherently patriarchal in our understanding of connecting and inherently heteronormative in our understanding of the way in which we can link um, these different forms of oppression. And the, my other question was for Stephanie, um, well, I guess kind of both questions a bit for you, um, which I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on um, black queer necro politics, um, because we talk a lot about black necro politics and we understand all these kind of historical continuities from enslavement and colonization and what have you. And I was wondering if you could touch upon that, please. All right, thank you very much, Adam. And we've got a final question here and then we're gonna move on to answer the questions and hopefully we have some time for some more. Yes. Okay, this is to all the panelists. Can you say who you are, please? Uh, I'm Professor Cecile Wright, uh, University of Nottingham. Um, the previous, one of the previous speakers from the previous, spout, um, panel gave us uh, an array of statistics. I'm putting this to everybody. Could you please uh, throw some light on your understanding of these statistics? Uh, only of all the professors that we have in our UK universities, only 17 are black African women. Um, black African women or black women disproportionately suffer from and die from premature death, from high blood pressure, heart attacks that are linked to stress-related lifestyle because of their race. Black women uh, have suffered disproportionately from the austerity agenda in the sense that they've been cleansed from, many of them highly educated, uh, worked within the public sector. As you know, the public sector has uh, suffered uh, from the austerity agenda and black women in particular. Black women are also disproportionately entering university, coming out with uh, uh, highly educated, but as David Cameron said at his uh, conference speech, there is a situation that they are being discriminated when they try to enter the, the labor market because some of them have uh, non-anglicized names. Okay. Can you just throw some light on those things about the okay. lives of black women okay, across thank the you, UK, thank you, please? I'm cutting you because I, know I said I was going to keep it short. Thank you very much. So let's go to, over to the um, panelists. And again, I also, because we've got to, we want to have a discussion with some more people as well. So who would like to take the first one? So the first question really was around um, uh, the Guardian, the Guardian article and around being mixed race and, and what that actually meant. Maybe you want to actually start with that one at all. Um, I, I don't mind who. 
Yeah. Um, I, Stephanie, do you want to start? I'm not sure about talking to being mixed race. I'm not sure. I haven't read. You take it however you want to. But uh, misogynoir, um, definitely. Um, misogynoir speaks to the intersection of being black and being a woman and very specific kind of quality um, to the experiences black women exp um, have. So being seen as subhuman, but also um, hypersexual. As, um, and as well around trans misogynoir trans misogynoir, so the differences between the experiences of cis women, uh, women who um, identify as women from when they were born, and trans women as well. Um, I'm trying to mix up the question, because I also want to answer to Adam's, Adam's question as well around uh, queer necropolitics. Um, I guess that's the, the sort of more recent work of Haritawan. I don't know if you've heard of them. Um, they're in Toronto, talking about how questioning the, the sort of LGBT movement and uh, basically the kind of basic strides in equality um, and what that means for uh, people like, who are marginalised within that movement, who are, you know, racialised. Um, so kind of the, the strides towards equality and inclusion within a neoliberal project, within a um, structurally racist um, state, within um, an anti-black state. So where does that leave um, queer and trans people of colour? Um, and specifically around... Uh, how some queer subjects are now, and also you, you see in trans subjects, are being invited into the fold of, you know, a neoliberal life. Um, they're seen as, um, Harry Torn talks about queer, uh, queer subjects who are seen as a lovely sight now in our, in our um, world, in our media, but what kind of queer and trans subjects are Absolutely. being seen as a lovely sight? And who are the others who are still being um, set aside, who are left for that? Um, left for that kind of social death or a premature physical death that we see particularly with trans women of colour and specifically black trans women and such high rates of violence um, and poverty, unemployment and the, the types of violence they experience are, um, you know, the most uh, dehumanising violence. You get people who are being mutilated and, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's a... It's a, a specific, um, a specific intersections of uh, transphobia, uh, racism, uh, colonialism within all that is really important to speak to, and they're the voices that aren't being heard within Black Lives Matter as well. Thank you, thank you very much, Stephanie. Yes, Ella. To just kind of add to the point about mixedness and misogynoir, so I haven't read the article either, but I mean, misogynoir obviously changes with the closer you are to whiteness, right? So. Misogyny doesn't affect me in the way it does darker skinned black women. Mm -hmm. And your levels of visibility also change in the public forum. You may not be represented in a positive light by no means, mm -hmm. but you are you are visible because you are seen as closer to whiteness, it's more acceptable in the public realm. So I just kind of wanted to add that how misogyny kind of plays out differently for different women. I think, I think that's really important. I think that's a really important point, and I think that's something which presumably will come up perhaps later on, I don't know, regarding the dialogue, because it is an active and real dialogue regarding who and what happens around um, Black Lives Matter. And the closer you are towards the spectrum of whiteness, perhaps your voice is more visible than if it is um, towards the black end of the spectrum. Mm. Althea, is there something you'd like to add to the discussion of any of those questions at all? Yeah, I just want to really affirm your point that you made. Um, it's a really important point. I would say language is important and with the utmost respect, um, I think to say I'm going to be brutal with you in this space is, you know, we, we, let's not be brutal to each other. So maybe we can gently encourage everyone to speak. Um, so I just wanted to say that I thought it was important, um, particularly as we talk about the brutality of women and black women on this stage too. So let's be kind to each other. Um, absolutely right. The consequences of living in a racial patriarchy ultimately can mean death. Um, and that's exactly what you're saying. And we've heard different, def different definitions, actual death, social death, um, slow death. Mm -hmm. But that's what you're speaking to. And I just wanted to acknowledge what you said and just say thank you. Thank you very much, Althea. Um, OK, can we take some more questions from the back, please? And if you can walk to the uh, people, that'd be great. Yep, we've got this person here. Just say what your name is, please. That'd be great. Hello, my name's Jacqueline. Hi, Jacqueline. Um, I just want to make a point um, around um, being mixed race and being an activist and intersectionality and everything else. I think it's um, a misunderstanding to think that um, the closer you are to white, the more you have an opportunity to speak, to act, to function. 
um, I think it's very much about context. Um, and it's not been my lived experience, um, I have to say, you know, as a person um, who is mixed race, um, basically, when you are the only person of colour in the room, you are the only person of colour in the room. And I think there are um, issues within our community itself in terms of how mixed race people are perceived. Okay. So I think, you know, we have to be very, very careful around that. That thank you. Thank you, um, Jacqueline. Is it Jacqueline or Jackie? Jacqueline. Jackie, thank you very much. I mean, we do need to get some controversial. We need to get some discussion going. So thank you, Jackie. Um, next person, please. Right. Yes. And your name is? I can't hear you. Sorry. If you hold the microphone, it'll be really helpful. It wasn't working. All oh, right. Okay. Thank you. My name is Nat. Yeah. I'm wanting to ask the panel to go in a different direction yeah. in terms of um, black women's lives and black lives matters. There seems to be one construction of violence um, that is from the state, right? But then there's also an internal violence that takes place against black women from within our own community. How do you see Black Lives Matters addressing that particular question and helping to kind of um, engage and empower both men and women in a dialogue that can be more progressive? Thank you, that's really helpful. Very, very helpful question. Thank you. Um, any other questions before we move on to answer these ones here? Yes, we've got, yes. Oh. I'm not sure who I'm looking I've got at the mic, there. So I'm, you... I'm going to talk because I've got the mic. Right? Yeah, hi, oh, and you are? <laughs> uh, Kai Indy, Kai Indy Andrews. Oh, yes, hi. Hi, Kai hey, Indy. Right. <laughs> um, quick question, just... Uh, there's definitely an issue with uh, trans, queer, and female representation and visibility in the movement. Uh, to what extent does that mean that we need to change something like Black Lives Matter or change the Black Power movement, or does it necessitate that we have a different movement for those different things? Okay. Does that make sense? Thank you very much. Thank you. And final question here with this person here at the front. Thank you. My name is Vigile. Um, I've got two questions for the panel. Make them quick. Question number one is, does the panel think Equality Act 2010 is the solution to the problem? Yeah. And if they think that's the solution to the problem, do they think we can voice or we can suggest that human rights can be the curriculum so that children, they learn from the basics, the understanding of what a human being is? Question number two is, do you have any research or the latest figures about how our children are performing in primary schools? And if you do, I'll appreciate you to know, if you don't, I just want to put this to yourselves. I once heard that our children in certain schools are not, are not, they are not, they are not assessed according to their ability. Instead, there is a blanket umbrella that okay. they are expected not to achieve. And if that is the case, we have to fight for the new generation, our children, to achieve and invest in education. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. So we've got a few questions here. We'll do our best to try and answer them. We've got a, we're kind of running through time. We've got a few questions, to, and we'll answer these um, as we've got. We've got the opportunity and context. We've got black women and internal violence and what happens to black, black women and how we um, work with ourselves. We've also got the fact of a question which is being raised around um, Black Lives Matter and, and how it incorporates some of the other voices around um, trans, transgender, um, and also um, the, the uh, QT POC aspect, and, and whether we actually have a new, new um, different form around that, we don't know, and also around the equality issue and whether the 2010 Act. So let's take, let's start, let's start with um, Ella first, I'm gonna do Stephanie, and then we're gonna do Althea, and we go back the other way around as well. Okay. Um, so I was, I was just gonna say, I think it's really important that you highlight that, you know, not the, the mixed race experience is not, the same all over. And we also have a voice of silence, and obviously that plays out really differently, so I thought that was really important. Um, I'm not from the UK, and my research is not very UK-centric, but what I was gonna say is that Kimberly Crenshaw published um, a report um, on black girls in, in the school system in America, and I found that very disturbing to read, and it kind of plays into the video that was mentioned earlier, about how they were brutalized, how they were more subject to being disciplined, and I just kind of wanted to put that into the conversation as that is like a broader phenomenon, the way we teach children how they are how they are assessed and how they are how they are seen. And then okay, thank you, thank you, Ella. 
Um, I want to speak to the two questions uh, from the lady about the internal kind of uh, eruptions, I suppose, in black communities, and also about whether there should be a separate forum for, um, you know, the other voices that maybe we're not comfortable hearing from. Maybe that's what the question's about. Um, so I was going to say, um, in terms of QTPOC, um the, the organisations that I've, I've worked with uh, tend to be voluntary run, uh, underfunded or have no funding. They are very much um, kind of separate to LGBT and um, black communities. They're off on their own and they're dealing with a range of um, issues that come from the intersections of racism, queer phobia, transphobia and poverty, colonialism. And if we're talking about Black Lives Matter, then, you know, surely all Black Lives Matter, you can't, you can't um, have a separate one for those who perhaps other, some people feel uncomfortable talking about. Um, and that's the issue there also with the kind of internal problems within black communities. I think the lady was speaking about, about um, sexism and misogynoir. Um, and very recently in um, the UK, we had issues within a, a black movement, within an organization about a, a, a convicted rapist was involved in the organization without anyone knowing that he was a convicted rapist. Um, and it left women unsafe. In fact, I spoke to Patrice Collars about it mm. when she came and visited. And I said to her, how do you deal with this stuff? And she said, yes, it is a part of the movement. It is part of Black Lives Matter that even though we're all here saying Black Lives Matter, we'll still get homophobia, transphobia, sexism within, within the organization. You'll have men at protests grabbing women. Um, so it's something that we need to talk about within Black Lives Matter. It can't be something for outside Thank of it. Thanks, Thanks Stephanie. Afia. Yeah, just um, thank you for the questions. Um, I would just say the the binary of you know state violence and then this internal or community violence is a false binary. We really need to think about how they interact. Yeah. They are also intersectional. Um, so, for instance, where there is higher unemployment, where there is higher poverty, that then affects the numbers of domestic violence goes up. Um, and there is a relationship. It's not a simple one. It's not if you're unemployed, you know, you're going to be violent. But there are correlations between poverty, um, access to medical care, um, affect also homicide rates. So for young black women in the United States, homicide is the leading cause of death. Mm. Leading cause of death. And as you were saying, black women are also going to face particular kind of cancers uh, and a range of, of healthcare issues. And so state violence and then violence within communities, violence um, between from men or women as well, they all intersect and they're relational. Um, to the other question, um, are we, you know, are we, do we need to look back or do we need to change from you know our usable past, I think what we need to do is recenter some ideas. It's not always about rebuilding something new. I think it's about understanding what um, the potential of black power movements, the potential of the Black Panthers, and the way women navigated within the Black Panther Party, um, the way that they brought reproduction justice to the forefront, forefront in the Black Panther Party. Um, and the way they complicated um, debates around abortion or mm -hmm. um, access to the pill. So we really need to, and they, because they're racialized issues as well, as gendered issues. So we need to look back, but we need to look back with an understanding. We need a political literacy, basically, to understand our past before we start figuring out, oh, do we leave that? Do we need to do something new? Um, many of these issues that we are pushing against now have been pushed against for a long, long, long Thank time. Thank you. Thank you, Althea. Very, very, very helpful. And while we're also on that discussion, just think about something very local to us, which has just taken place, and, and um, uh, George Osborne was actually so-called defeated within, with the help of the Lords. And I asked the question myself, which was around tax credits and where's the voices of poor black families and what the effect of that is. And when we start looking at that, there's no discussion around it. No one's actually raised it. What's the impact on that? And that's how we need to start raising that question. We don't need to look to America. We can look at the UK 
on what's actually happening. So that's just that. Final question, we've got one here, and I think we had one somewhere else, and that's it, we need to then call it quits. Okay, it was mainly a point of interest because I was at the, um, I was in Manchester. Can you make it really week. quick with the question. Yeah. Uh, I was in Manchester last weekend for the, um, the conference to commemorate the Pan-African Congress. So um, there was uh, two resolutions came out. It was a really important, and some of what you're talking about now was just touched upon because there was not enough time. So one of the main resolutions got the resounding smack is there's going to be a Women in Pan-Africanism conference next year. So, yes, yeah, so just please make a note of that and I'll get more information. Fantastic. Too. Okay, thank you very much. That's a statement, isn't it? Really? Yeah, okay. There's somebody over there, but I'm not sure who it is. Yes, can you say your name, please? That's a final question. Uh, hello, my name's Tom. Hi, Tom. Um, I'm just kind of interested in your thoughts on role models within like the trans community and how if you think certain trans individuals can almost claim a monopoly on the voice of the community for example can certain trans individuals like Caitlyn Jenner actually be a negative influence on the community as a whole okay all right and, and is that is that um role models for trans com community and can we broaden it a bit because the last question to also um role models in relation to black women, because this is a gender panel, yeah. and whether they can actually open that discussion as well. Is that okay? Yeah, certainly. Yeah? Okay, so can we take yourself, Althea, first of all, then Stephanie, then Ella, and then we're gonna call it quits. Okay, um, I'll be brief. Um, I will just say one statistic. The statistic is on the Black Lives Matters movement webpage, and it is that the age 35, is a life expectancy of a transgender woman, 35. That's obviously a black transgender woman. That is a life expectancy, 35. Um, I think that tells you a lot about the ways in which we might hold up certain individuals which raise really serious, dangerous issues for others. Caitlyn Jenner's story just recently now, she's the glamour, um, glamour woman of the year, doesn't speak to that statistic, and it doesn't speak to that violence and that danger. Um, we can get distracted. Let's just remember that. Thank you, thank you, Althea. Definitely. Yeah, and echo that, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trans, so I wouldn't want to, you know, step on too much uh, the trans community and how they see, see their role models, but I do, um, think you know role mod models we have to take with a little bit of um, pinch of salt about who the media uh, celebrates and who the media continues to ignore um, so Caitlyn Jenner you know in terms of visibility it's great that she's you know out and she's who she is um, but she you know she is a, a white republican woman Absolutely. you know w w she's not talking to the intersections of, of what it means to be a black trans woman um, and then you have Laverne Cox, who is amazing, and she pushes, she pushes, um, you know, the emphasis on how she's there to speak, but there are other people who aren't there to speak, and how uh, black trans women in particular are still seen as almost ungrievable within black communities, not he not heard and not cared for. Thank you, Stephanie. Ella. Um, and because we broadened the idea of role models to black women more generally, I kind of wanted to link it back to your question about what does it mean when we have so few black professors in academia and so few black women as well? What does that do to knowledge production? And how does that impact how many students of color then pursue knowledge production? Because there was a very important video for why is my professor uh, black, not, black. not black. Yeah, not black. Yeah, why isn't my professor black? And there was a student who was talking about how they were so tired of always being surrounded by whiteness in their studies that for them academia wasn't even a conceivable career choice. So what does that mean for when we talk about knowledge production as well? That's really helpful. Now I've just been asked, I so suppose you saw the uh, gentleman who just came up, I'm just gonna really try and address that point as well and then we're gonna say thank you to our panel. Um, there was a question which was raised by, your, by yourself earlier which was around um, children and, um, and the impact of, of children and the, and the data. Well, I haven't got statistical data on that at this present moment because you know, I haven't got it with me, but one of the things we can say is that historically around um, uh, um, African, African Caribbean children, the notion of achievement and what that means, it's, um, there's a big discussion around whether the gap is actually widening. 
And at one stage, it was closing, and it seems to be widening even more. And it's widening to such a depth that people aren't even mentioning the word race, they're not even mentioning the word um, black children within the classroom, and it is problematic. But as yourselves, as activists, as, as audiences, and parents, and community members, whoever you are, you need to actually start raising that question and saying, what is actually happening to our young child in the classroom? So you need to go back and, and work through that. Um, the last point I wanted to say really um, fits with all of this is that um, collectively, collectively, as part of this panel, we just really want to look at the fact of Black, black Lives Matter, say our name is part of that campaign, and I think is really, really helpful. And it's not forgetting that collectively, each one of our colleagues here, you've got Ella, who's a master's student. She's not a PhD student, a master's student, fantastic here. You've got Stephanie here, who's a PhD candidate, who's at Brighton. We've got Althea here, who's a postdoc, who's done her PhD, and is now um, you know, in the world of work, in academia as well. So these three people are the ones which are starting to come up into um, what's actually happening and will be the ones will be writing about it, pushing their, um, their voices around this particular thing. So you have to support them. And at the same time, you support other um, academics as well, which have been in the system as well. So I just want to say thank you very much for the panelists. I think that's really, really good.